So, I'm very happy to be able to announce that next is um, Hannah Ginsberg, um, who is a professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley, and we're incredibly happy to be able to have her speak today. Um, she'll be speaking on skepticism and quietism about meaning and normativity. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, but it looks pretty easy to move. Um, I have a tendency to talk uh, too loud sometimes. Uh, so, is there a way of turning the microphone down a little bit, do you think? Um, All right, well, anyway, if, if, I'm, if I'm, like, booming uh, in an unbearably loud way, uh, please, uh, somebody let me know. Oh, so there's a handout, and the handout is basically just, uh, I won't really be referring to it, uh, but it's just a crazy of the talk. In his famous discussion of Wittgenstein on rules in private language, Kripke describes Wittgenstein as having invented a new form of skepticism. And according to Kripke, the skeptical problem which Wittgenstein raises is, quote, the most radical and original skeptical problem that philosophy has seen to date. The problem casts doubt on the possibility of meaning, rules, and intentional content. If it's accepted as a genuine problem, then, and presumably this is part of what makes it so radical, we cannot so much as raise more traditional skeptical problems, say about the external world or other minds, since in order to raise such questions, we need to take for granted our capacity to make meaningful claims or be in contentful mental states. And that is, of course, the capacity which Kripke skepticism calls into question. Philosophers have disagreed both about whether the skeptical problem Kripke identifies is to be found in Wittgenstein and about whether it's a genuine problem. John McDowell, in particular, argues that it is neither in Wittgenstein nor is it a genuine problem. He reads Wittgenstein not as challenging the possibility of meaning and intentionality, but rather as trying to undermine the temptation to raise such challenges by getting us to see that questions about the possibility of meaning and intentionality are illusory. McDowell himself endorses the approach he sees in Wittgenstein, which he describes with some qualifications as quietist, and he sees it as telling against the sceptical argument which Kripke develops. In this talk, I'm going to argue that McDowell is wrong to endorse quietism about meaning and intentional content. And I'm going to argue against McDowell that the sceptical challenge raised by Kripke is a genuine one. But I'll also be arguing against Kripke that the challenge is not effective. And in criticising Kripke's sceptical challenge to meaning, I'll be adopting a view which, like McDowell's, is quietist. My version of quietism, however, will apply not to the question of how meaning or intentional content is possible, but to a question which I take to be more fundamental, even more fundamental, we might say, the question of how there can be normative accordance or normative fit between a sign conceived non-intentionally and a particular use of that sign. I'll thus, thus be trying to motivate skepticism about meaning as a genuine problem while rejecting as illusory along lines which McDowell would call quietist, skepticism about the normative relation between signs considered as finite non-intentional objects and our behaviour with respect to them. So section two, Kripke's sceptical argument. I'll begin with a brief and highly, highly simplified sketch of Kripke's sceptical argument. And one of the simplifications is that I'm going to be leaving out Kripke's critique of the dispositional view of meaning. This is an important part of the argument when, when we're considering uh, opposition to Kripke's meaning skepticism from a naturalistic standpoint. 
But it's not relevant either for McDowell's critique of Kripke or for my own response to Kripke, so that's why I'm leaving it out of account uh, in this sketch of the argument. The argument is, of course, going to be familiar to a lot of you, but it may not be familiar to all of you. Uh, so I'm going to lay it out anyway. And in any case, even for those of you who are familiar with it, I still think it's good to review it. So Kripke imagines a scenario on which never having before encountered an addition problem involving numbers greater than 57, you're presented with the question, what is 68 plus 57? And you give the answer, uh, 125. And I'm just going to write up uh, Because the important thing is, if I just say the question, what is 68 plus 57, you might hear that as the question, what is 68 plus 57? But what's at issue is your response to a certain sign, namely the plus sign, conceived of as a sign. So it's like you're shown that. And it's assumed that you know the number, you're familiar with the numerals, you understand that 68, this numeral stands for 68, this numeral you understand the question mark. The only thing that, it's, that is in question is uh, the meaning of this cross. So, uh, but you, you see this, and then you give the answer, 125, uh, which is 68 plus 57. And now a skeptic challenges your entitlement to say 125, not on the grounds that it's arithmetically incorrect, so it's agreed that 68 plus 57 is 125, but on the grounds that it is metalinguistically incorrect, it does not accord with your previous use of that sign or signs with that shape. His ground for this challenge is the skeptical hypothesis that by the sign plus or the word plus, you previously meant not addition, but a different function, quadition, which yields as its value the sum of x and y if both x and y are less than 57, and otherwise the value 5. If this skeptical hypothesis is true, then you ought to respond to the question by saying 5. More precisely, you ought to say 5 on the assumption that you don't intend to start using the sign in a different way from the way you used it before. I'm mostly going to omit this qualification for the present discussion because I think he just accepts the assumption and I think that he assumes that you're going to accept it too. But now, the skeptic goes on to argue, you can't rule out the skeptical hypothesis because nothing in your history, either your mental or behavioral history, is inconsistent with that hypothesis. The hypothesis that you meant quadition fits your past answers to plus questions, questions using that sign or the word plus, just as well as the addition hypothesis and anything else you appeal to, past instructions you gave yourself, or a mental image, or a distinctive feeling associated with that sign, anything like that can be interpreted so as to be compatible with the hypothesis that what you meant was quadition. The immediate upshot, according to Kripke, is that you're now saying 125 in answer to this question, is an unjustified leap in the dark. Since you can't rule out that you meant quadition, your past history of use of the plus sign gives you no more ground for saying 125 than it gives you for saying five. And since Kripke is assuming that you now intend to use this sign as you did in the past, your response is arbitrary. It's a matter of brute inclination. Kripke presents the skeptical challenge at the outset as though it were epistemological. You don't know or you're not justified in claiming that you meant addition rather than quadition. So on the face of it, it looks as though it leaves open the possibility that you did mean addition. You just don't know that you mean addition rather than quadition. Or you lack the reason to believe that you mean addition rather than quadition. However, Kripke goes on to say explicitly that it's not merely epistemological. Uh, this is something that Jim referred to in his talk yesterday. Uh, Kripke says it's not just an epistemological challenge, it's also metaphysical. The point isn't just that you don't know you meant addition, it's rather that there is no fact about you which constitutes your having meant or now meaning addition. 
And because it's metaphysical, it applies not just to your past meaning, but to your present meaning as well. So quoting from Kripke, if there was no such thing as your meaning plus rather than plus in the past, neither can there be any such thing in the present. Now, it's not obvious how the move from the epistemological to the metaphysical claim is supposed to work. And I think that this difficulty about how Kripke gets from the epistemological skepticism to what we might call the metaphysical skepticism, the idea that there's no fact, that your meaning plus consists in, I think that's something that Jim is responding to, or was responding to, when he claimed yesterday that Kripke is muddling together somehow the two forms of skepticism, uh, those two forms that he calls uh, Cartesian and Kantian. Um, I have a different reading, uh, I think, uh, as my sketch of the argument will indicate. Uh, I'm not sure about this, um, but I do think that the argument has, uh, it actually intends to begin with an epistemological conclusion uh, and to then, uh, sorry, begins with an epistemological premise and leads to uh, a conclusion. I've got these nice points. Uh, I, I just need to put my hand up. Uh, so, sorry, that, that was a, uh, uh, just a digression to connect it with what Jim was saying yesterday. So, as I understand the argument, Kripke sees the metaphysical conclusion as a consequence of the idea which follows from the epistemo epistemological premise that when now shown that question, you say 105, 125, uh, that is a blind leap in the dark. That move is an unjustified leap in the dark. Because Kripke thinks that if there is any fact that constitutes your now meaning addition, it must be a fact which puts you in a position to justify your responding to this. <coughs> this. So if nothing is available to you now as a justification for saying 125, if there's nothing in your view as making 125 appropriate, then there can be no fact which constitutes your meaning addition. So what makes the idea of meaning, in Kripke's terms, vanish into thin air, is not the initial epistemological thought that you don't know what you meant in the past by the plus sign, but rather the subsequent thought that, given your lack of knowledge about what you meant, you're not now in a position to justify your responding to the present occurrence of the sign as you do. If there's nothing more than brute inclination that leads you to say 125 rather than 5, then the sign plus, from your point of view, is meaningless. There's no fact about you which makes you justified in responding 125, and hence no fact in which your meaning addition could consist. So very roughly then, I think we can think of the argument as having the four-point four-part structure uh, laid out on the handout. The first step, which is clearly epistemological, is the claim that, for all you know, you previously meant quadition rather than addition by plus. This step, I think of this as the skeptical hypothesis, is supported by the consideration that there's no evidence to which you can appeal to show that you meant addition rather than quadition. The second step, which Kripke sees as following from the first step, is that you're now saying 125 is a leap in the dark, or a matter of brute inclination. Now this step, I guess it can be seen as epistemological because it's about justification, but it can also, I think, be regarded as metaphysical <coughs> because it's saying something about the status, the very status of your response, because you're not justified in taking 125 to be the appropriate response, there's a sense in which we can say that the response itself has the meta metaphysical status of being unjustified or ungrounded. Now, since the same line of thought holds for your responses to plus queries in general, this gets us to our third step, which is the metaphysical conclusion that there is nothing for your meaning addition by plus to consist in, and this conclusion in turn generalizes to all other linguistic expressions, yielding the fourth step, the incredible conclusion, Kripke says, that all language is meaningless. 
So section two, McDowell's, sorry, oh yeah, McDowell's rejection of meaning skepticism. Actually, I think it's section three. Something went funny with the number in there. I turn now to McDowell's response to Kripsky's skeptical argument. McDowell's critique is mostly addressed directly to the claim, which I identified as the third unambiguously metaphysical step of the argument, that there's no fact which constitutes your meaning addition by plus. But I believe that if McDowell were presented with the argument in the form I've offered it, he would reject the first epistemological step. For McDowell, there is no difficulty about how I could know that I meant addition rather than quadition by plus. This is something I can know about myself, just as I can know now that I mean addition. The illusion that I can't know, either that I meant addition in the past, or that I mean addition now, stems from the mistaken assumption that I need to appeal to non-intentionally characterized facts about myself in order to have evidence for claims about what I mean or meant. Kravke thinks that in order to justify my claim that I meant addition, I need to be able to identify some non-intentionally described fact which, as Kripke puts it, establishes that I meant addition. But, McDowell might respond, what's wrong with simply citing the fact that I meant addition? If I'm allowed to appeal to such facts about myself as the fact that I gave such and such answers to previous queries using the plus sign, or that I gave myself such and such instructions, or that I had such and such a mental state, why not also appeal directly to the fact that I meant addition? Isn't that a perfectly good fact? Since skepticism about memory is not in question, this is something I can know simply in virtue of my current understanding of the plus sign. I know it means addition. I can remember that I used it before in accordance with that meaning, and so I know I meant addition by it. Similarly, as regards Kripke's metaphysical conclusion at step three, there's no difficulty, from McDowell's point of view, in identifying a fact in which my meaning or having meant addition consists. There is simply the intentional fact of my meaning addition. And there's no need for puzzlement about how a fact of this kind can, so to speak, reach normatively into the future, so that recognition of this fact can justify me in responding to the query with 125. It's just in the nature of intentional states, like meaning and understanding, that particular responses can accord or fail to accord with them. I think there's a quote in the handout to that effect. Well, Kripke considers this kind of response very briefly under the heading of a view on which the state of meaning addition by plus is sui generis. I think that's also in the handout. But he dismisses this kind of response as desperate because, he says, it leaves the character of the sui generis state mysterious. McDowell, on the other hand, rejects the charge of mystery. Any appearance of mystery, he would say, is an illusion which comes from our refusing to recognize evident facts about the meaningfulness of linguistic expressions and other symbols. Kripke's skepticism exemplifies what McDowell calls a sideways-on view of expressions of language. Kripke considers them not from a point of view from within our linguistic practices, but rather from an imagined external point of view, from a standpoint and I quote from McDowell, I think this is from Non-Cognitivism and Rule Following, from a standpoint, quote, independent of all the human activities and reactions that locate those practices in our whirl of organism. The expression whirl of organism there comes from Cavell. When Kripke raises the question of how you know you meant addition by plus, he is not considering the plus sign as we ordinarily do, namely as meaning addition. He's rather considering it as something semantically or normatively inert, something that needs to be given an interpretation if it's to be understood as meaning one thing rather than another. From the perspective of Kripke skeptic, the plus sign as you used it in the past was just two intersecting lines or a sequence of phonemes or graphemes something intrinsically meaningless. Assuming that you share that perspective, you cannot take for granted that you understood it as meaning addition. Instead, you have to indicate something about your past situation, which justifies your claim to have interpreted it 
as meaning addition rather than quadition. That's how Kripke sees it. But for McDowell, it is a distortion of our ordinary ways of thinking about the plus sign to consider it as simply an arrangement of lines in need of interpretation. For all of us trained in basic arithmetical symbolism, the plus sign does not stand in need of interpretation, but intrinsically means addition. McDowell puts this point in terms of Wittgenstein's own response to the seeming paradox about rule following, which Kripke claims to be elaborating. Wittgenstein says that the way to avoid the kind of skeptical problem which Kripke seems to be raising is to recognize that, quote, there is a way of grasping a rule which is not an interpretation. Uh, that's a quote from uh, Investigations 198. According to McDowell, Kripke's mistake is to fail to recognize this and to assume that all grasp of meaning, that is, all understanding, must be a matter of interpretation. He does not recognize or does not take seriously that in our ordinary dealings with familiar signs, we can understand them without having to interpret them. Now, I've just described the mistake which McDowell ascribes to Kripke as though McDowell thinks that it's easily avoided. In fact, McDowell thinks no such thing. He thinks it's very difficult to avoid a mistake like this because he thinks that we're subject to a constant temptation to take a sideways on view to our linguistic expressions or, which comes to the same thing, to suppose that they must be interpreted in order to be meaningful. So he thinks that work needs to be done to bring philosophers to see how it's possible to understand a sign without interpreting it. Drawing on an example used by Wittgenstein in the investigations, McDowell proposes that we can recognize this possibility by considering what it is to follow a signpost. When we follow a signpost, say a signpost with the tape at, with the tape at end to the right, I'll just draw one. Okay, this is a terrible signpost, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> When we follow a signpost <laughs> of that kind, um, we don't typically act on an interpretation of a signpost unless it's ambiguous, badly designed. We don't have to ask ourselves the question what the signpost means and then give ourselves some answer, say by saying the signpost points to the right. Rather, we simply go to the right. But our going to the right is not for all that merely automatic behavior, it reflects an understanding of what the signpost tells us to do. Uh, and here I'm thinking a little bit about what Abby said yesterday about the academic skeptics, the idea that we respond without forming a belief. Uh, Abby said that uh, for the academic skeptics, that response is like that of an animal. Uh, but McDowell, I think, is trying to point out a middle ground. I don't have to have a belief about what the signpost means. Um, but I still understand it as having a meaning when I respond to it, so my response is still different from that of an animal, even though I didn't need to form a belief to the effect that the signpost points to the right. So our going by the signpost, according to McDowell, involves our understanding the signpost without having to interpret it. It's the signpost itself and not the signpost under an interpretation which tells us which way to go. Once we see this possibility in the case of signposts, we can recognize it also, McDowell thinks, in our responses to linguistic expressions. In responding in the normal way to the question that I've got up there, I understand the plus sign without having to interpret it. It's the plus sign itself, not the plus sign as interpreted in some way, which tells me how to respond to the query. And this line of thought, very roughly, is supposed to get us to see that the plus sign is not any more than the signpost, normatively or semantically inert. It's supposed to undermine the assumption of Kripke's skeptic that we can think of the plus sign as just two intersecting lines, neutral between different possible interpretations. McDonald considers the objection that neither linguistic expressions nor signposts are intelligible to people who haven't undergone the relevant training. In order for me to understand the plus sign as meaning addition, I have to have been trained in the relevant linguistic practice, and he thinks that the corresponding point is true of signposts. That this signpost points to the right 
is something which is accessible to me only if I've undergone training in the use of signposts. I have to have been initiated into a practice of using signposts. But this doesn't undermine, according to McDowell, the idea that it's the plus sign itself, which, in the context of this query, calls for me to say 125. It doesn't undermine the idea that this sign essentially means addition. It doesn't force us to think of the plus sign as a mere pair of cross lines needing supplementation with an interpretation. All that the, subject, the supposed objection shows is that it takes training for the intrinsic meaning of the sign to become visible to a person. So Kripke's skeptical challenge is blocked at the first epistemological step. Because you're someone who's been initiated into the practice of mathematical symbolism, you simply recognize the plus sign as meaning addition, the way that you recognize the signpost as pointing to the right. And since the sign is, so to speak, already infused with its meaning, the way that the signpost is infused with its meaning, there is no room for alternative meanings. The skeptic can't make compelling to you the possibility that you either do or did understand that same sign as meaning something different. Uh, so next section, a defense of the skeptical argument. Well, I'll make clear in what follows. Both of I'm largely sympathetic to what McDowell says about signposts, and that I agree with him that the signpost case is relevant to the case of linguistic expressions and other symbols. But I disagree with him regarding his quietest rejection of Kripke's meaning skepticism. And in particular, I don't think that his appeal to the signpost example succeeds in motivating his quietism. The problem is that there's a disanalogy between signposts and linguistic expressions which I think prevents the lesson of the signpost example from carrying over to the example of linguistic science. And we can bring out this analogy by noting what appears to be the straightforward fact that signposts are typically comprehensible across languages and cultures, whereas the signs of language notoriously are not. So anyone traveling on the German highway for the first time will notice blue pointed signs with this word written on oh, that. Uh, can everybody see what that says? Uh, and apparently, I found this in a recent article uh, about traffic signs. Apparently, Polish commercial drivers like to tease their less experienced colleagues on a first trip into Germany by getting them to believe that Alsfart is the name of a very large town. <laughs> so, you know, you keep coming by. <laughs> and, yep, yep, that's still the turn off to Alsfart. <laughs> but while it is quite possible to imagine somebody being taken in in that way, at least for a while, it is almost impossible to imagine the more senior driver persuading his colleague that in Germany, a sign with this shape should be understood as indicating that one should go in this direction or to make a U-turn. For the driver new to Germany and not speaking German, the written expression on the signpost could have any number of meanings. But for the same driver, the shape of the sign can really have only one meaning, or at least one of a very small set of meanings. So actually, a sign that's shape, it could mean go this way. It could also mean look this way. It might be pointing to a sales um, image. But both of the meanings are related, as in indicating this way. And in particular, at least not without great strain, the sign can't be understood as indicating that it should be followed in any direction other than that of the tapered end. Now, the point I've just made about signposts is completely of a piece with, it's agreeing with McDowell's claim that the understanding of signposts doesn't require interpretation. The difficulty we might have in supposing that the highway sign should be followed in a different direction reflects the fact that signposts simply present themselves to us as normatively calling for or making appropriate a certain response or set of responses. There are items in the world with which some responses accord and others do not. So as McDowell claims, they do show us that there is a way of understanding a sign, which isn't an interpretation. 
Well, I'm questioning is whether this way of understanding is available for those signs which are used in more parochial human languages or forms of symbolism, and more specifically, whether we can appeal to it to defuse Kripke's skeptical challenge. I want to say that the answer is no. That this analogy between signposts and the signs of language prevents us from appealing to the kind of understanding we have in the signposts case to undermine the skeptical argument. So to see this, consider another aspect of the disanalogy related to the one I just described. While a signpost means the same across all linguistic communities, one and the same linguistic sign can have the same meaning in, sorry, one and the same linguistic sign can have a different meaning in different communities. So consider, for example, uh, the written sign, this written sign, which means, uh, you know what it means in English, uh, and it means red in German, and it means book in French. Or consider the phoneme sequence bet, which means bed in German, wager in English, and stupid or beast in French. Or for a real life example, consider the, uh, maybe I have a new page on this. Consider the notorious advertising poster. I wonder if any of you have heard of this. Uh, this was actually put up, it was an advertising test put up by the Dutch company in Nutrition in nine, uh, 2011, and it's advertising a milky drink uh, aimed at children, and on the poster it says, Which of course means, <laughs> Mama, this one, this one, this one. Um, I have now McDowell might. <laughs> I have some other examples, but I won't. Uh, unfortunately, most of the examples. Well, I'll just give you one example. If you go into a Danish elevator, you will see. I'm sorry, this is scatological. Um, but if you go to a Danish elevator, you will see an illuminated which goes on when the elevator is in motion, and it means uh, that the elevator in motion uh, is what it means. Apparently, when the Queen visited Copenhagen uh, a few years ago, uh, the, in the elevator that she used, this sign had to be covered up. I don't know if that's a myth, but... <laughs> um, so, McDowell might reply here that my characterization of this analogy is tendentious, Perhaps he might say, uh, this is not the same sign in uh, English as it is in Dutch. Perhaps we have to see the inscription on the Dutch poster or in the Danish elevator, merely as resembling a certain inscription of English, rather than supposing that we have here one of the same inscription, which can be understood as meaning two different things. But even if that's how we describe the situation, we still have this analogy in that a comparable situation, it seems, cannot arise in the case of signposts. <coughs> well, I can't put my signpost up against I'm afraid I have to draw another one. I'll try to be better job this time. Now, if the point here were only that the same linguistic sign can have different meanings in different languages or different symbolic systems, that wouldn't be enough to tell against McDowell's appeal to the signpost analogy. For if this were the case and we didn't realize it, then words and symbols like the plus sign might very well present themselves to us in the way that signposts do, that is, of having their meanings essentially. We might not be able to conceive of them as potentially bearing different meanings in different communities. But in fact, we do realize it. And this is part of what makes it possible for us to consider that a given sign for example, the plus sign might admit of different interpretations. We don't have to take the kind of sideways-on view which abstracts from human activities and practices in order to regard linguistic signs as themselves normatively inert, needing to be interpreted in one way rather than another in order to call for this or that behavior. All we need to do is to abstract from the particular language we speak. And that's possible, which that is possible for anyone who's aware of the multiplicity of different languages, even if she happens to speak only her native language. 
And that's what makes it possible for Kripke's ling- skepticism about linguistic meaning to get a grip on us, reflection on the way in which different histories of usage seem to be able to endow one and the same sign with different meanings, can make it quite natural for us to raise questions about what meaning a given sign has or had in the past. And once we've raised such questions, there's room at least for the skeptic to begin asking whether we have good reason for the belief that a given sign bears one possible meaning rather than another. Uh, So now to the next section, a response to the skeptical argument. So far I've been arguing against McDowell that Kripke raises a genuine skeptical difficulty for the possibility of linguistic meaning. But I now want to suggest a way of addressing the difficulty. The general shape of the approach I want to take can be seen in terms of the four-step structure of the argument as I laid it out in section two. I claimed in that section that McDowell can be seen in the first instance as challenging the first epistemological step. You do know, he thinks, that you meant addition by plus. But I went on in the next section to argue that McDowell is not entitled to this claim because even once we've mastered English or arithmetical symbolism, it remains open to us to conceive that the plus sign might have denoted a different mathematical function. So I think that the first step is defensible, and my response to Kripke is to allow him that first step, at least provisionally, but to deny him the second. Regardless of what I meant by the plus sign in the past, my now saying 125 in response to this question, that's not a leap in the dark. Rather, it's something that I can justify by appeal to the finite history of my use of the plus sign in the past. So I am allowed, according to Kripke's skeptic, to review the history of my responses to past questions. So I can know, for example, that when I was asked 2 plus 2, I answered 4. When I was asked 2 plus 5, I answered 7. Then so I was asked 18 plus 17, I answered 35. So you know, imagine this table much, much longer. In the light of this history of responses, I can now say, that when I'm shown this, it's appropriate for me now to say this. Now, if the skeptic is right, that in all of these past uses of the plus sign, I actually meant quadish. If he's right about that, then my response here doesn't accord with what I meant previously or with my previous intention. Well, I want to say, that doesn't make it unjustified. It doesn't make it a leap in the dark. For even if it doesn't conform to what I meant previously, it does accord with my uses of the plus sign. Or to put another way, it accords with this sign as it appears in the context of those previous uses. Given my uses of the term plus in the past, or the plus sign in the past, where these uses can be described finitely and non-intentionally, without saying that I use the term to mean addition, I can say that 125 is what's called for by the question, what is 68 plus 57? So how is this defensible, you might ask? Well, here I want to appeal, just like McDowell, to the analogy with signposts, but I want to apply the analogy differently. I want to say that the signpost is the analogue, not of the uninterpreted plus sign all on its own, but rather of the uninterpreted plus sign together with its history of use. So imagine that I have in front of me a table listing all my previous responses to past questions with at the end the uh, inscription. So let's just imagine this this whole table complete and with this question at the end. And keep in mind that the only sign whose meaning is in question is the plus sign. I understand how to read a table and I know what the numerals mean, and the only thing that is left open is what these signs mean. I suggest that we can think of what we have here as like a signpost, which points to the numeral 125. I can just see, well, with a bit of thinking, I can come to see that what is called for, given what's now in front of me, is for me to write or say 125, 
I can't take seriously that what is called for in this context could be the number 5 rather than the num number 125 any more than I can take seriously that this signpost calls for going to uh, that coat rack over there. So while the 68 plus 57 query in isolation can seem to me to stand in need of interpretation in order for me to understand it, the query together with my history of the use of the plus sign does not. And we can make this comparison more vivid by considering the example from Wittgenstein on which Kripke's quadition example is based. Wittgenstein asks us to consider a case in which a pupil is trained in the use of expression add two by being taught to develop the series two, four, six, eight, ten, and so on, and then gets up to a thousand, and then this pupil goes on with 1004 and 1008. Such a pupil, Wittgenstein says, is like someone who naturally follows a pointing hand in the direction from fingertip to wrist rather than the other way around. We might also think of this pupil as like somebody who is naturally inclined to follow this signpost in that direction. Now, I think the right reaction, that the right reaction to Wittgenstein's example, is to say that the pupil is just wrong about what's called for by the situation. If a pupil has been shown the use of the word add to in the way described and is now given the command add to to 1000, what is called for is that she write 1002, not 1004. So we can think of this as the sequence of numbers all filled out as basically like a signpost which is pointing to 1002. This is the right thing to say in the light of one's previous uses of the expression uh, add to. Uh, I realize I'm going slower than I thought I did, so I had a bit more to say. Um, but I think I'm going to skip that. Uh, and I'll end with my two concluding observations. Uh, basically what I wanted to say, <laughs> the bit that I'm skipping, uh, is just that I want to recapitulate that I'm saying that we should answer quickly skeptic by provisionally conceding his first step, but rejecting the second step, and so denying his ground for the skeptical conclusion that there's no fact about what he meant. Once you've got the skeptic to agree that this, regardless of what you meant by plus in the past, this is not a leap in the dark, then you lose the rationale for saying that this sign is meaningless. So I'll end with two observations about how the point I'm making here relates to Kripke and to McDowell. The first point, the first observation is that I'm rejecting an assumption which both Kripke and McDowell take for granted. Namely, that if you're justified in responding to the 68 plus 57 query with 125, this can only be because you're in a position to know that you mean or meant addition by plus. More generally, both Kripke and McDowell take for granted that your right to claim the appropriateness of your behavior with respect to a linguistic sign must depend on your having grasped what the sign means. And McDowell is clear that he takes this to be the case not just for signs of language, but for signposts also. He thinks that what you're according with when you follow the signpost is not the signpost as a mere ball on a post, but the signpost as understood by you that is the signpost understood as pointing to the right. And he puts this by saying that the subject who follows the signpost is according with a rule which the signpost expresses, with the meaning of the signpost, or with her understanding of the signpost. But I'm suggesting that in both the linguistic case and the signpost case, a subject's entitlement to respond to a sign in one particular way rather than another doesn't have to rest on her recognition of it as meaningful. More generally, I want to suggest that a finite object, non-intentionally conceived, can be recognized by us as normatively calling for one particular response rather than another. So putting the point even more generally, 
the idea that there can be normative accordance between objects in the world and our responses to those objects does not depend on our already conceiving the world in intentional terms. To put the same point another way, the thought of our responses to objects as normatively called for by those objects or as appropriate to them is more primitive than the thought of our responses as governed by rules which those objects express or meanings which those objects bear. And I'll say parenthetically here that I actually take this to be the primary lesson of Kant's critique of judgment, in particular Kant's aesthetic theory, although I won't try to expand on that point here. Uh, it's something we can always talk about in question period if you want. But it's because of this that I think you're entitled, in the situation set up by Kripke Skeptic, to take 125 to be appropriate to the class query without your having first ruled out the sceptical hypothesis. As regards the sceptical argument, the thought here might have some affinity with G. E. Moore's response to Cartesian scepticism. Moore takes his grip on the particular belief that he has two hands to be more secure and more basic than his grip on the more general belief in the existence of the external world. So he doesn't think he needs to rule out skeptical hypothesis incompatible with the existence of the external world as a condition of asserting that he has two hands. Somewhat similarly, I take our grip on the idea that I should say 125 rather than 5 in the response to the past query, or that I should go this rather than that way in response to the signpost, as more secure than our grip on the thought that plus means addition, or that the signpost means to go to the right. This brings me finally to the second observation about how my view relates to Kripke and McDowell. It might seem that I'm simply being dogmatic in insisting that I'm justified in saying 125 in response to the class query or going this direction when I see the signpost. Uh, since I'm denying that what justifies me in these cases is my grasp of the meaning of the class query or the signpost, doesn't that mean I'm under an obligation to say something about what it is that justifies me? It's at this point that I think something like McDowell's quietism is warranted. So I reject it as quietism for the case of the signs of language because I think there is a genuine motivation for raising foundational questions about the possibility of linguistic meaning. It's a motivation which emerges from really ordinary reflection on ordinary social facts about the way in which the meanings of expressions are related to their history of use in particular cultures. We don't have to be philosophers to see words in abstraction from their meanings and so to be motivated or open to asking the kind of foundational or sceptical question that's dramatized in Kripke's reading of Wittgenstein. But I don't think we have the same sort of motivation for questioning our entitlement to the intuitions I've just been defending. Uh, for example, the intuition that this series points to 1002 rather than 1004. At least if we remain within ordinary reflection, as I want to call it, we can't take seriously the possibility that the right tapering signpost tells us to go left, or that a pointing hand should be followed in the direction from fingertip to wrist, or that the series uh, should be continued with 1004, or that the right thing to put here is 125. Regarding these basic intuitions about the appropriateness of our responses to these particular objects in the world, Quietism seems to me here to be the most defensible option. Thank you very much.